Good afternoon. Welcome Pennsylvania anglers and boaters, fellow commissioners, and commission staff. I am calling this meeting of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's Habitat and Environmental Committee to order at 1 p.m. This meeting is being conducted online and it is also being live broadcast in real time with commissioners and staff participating remotely. This session is being recorded. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and use of this session. A recording of this committee meeting will be available on the Commission's YouTube page within a few days. My name is Dawn Anderson, and I'm honored to be chair of this committee. I will now conduct the committee roll call. Vice Chair Eric Kassar. Here. Don. Uh, member Charles Charlesworth. Member Rick Kaufman. Present. Member Dan Pastore. Present. And uh, our ex officio member, President of the Commission, B.J. Small. I also welcome all, all the other non-committee member commissioners joining us. Uh, we have four discussion items today uh, that will be presented by our staff. Uh, they are Lake Habitat uh, 2022 Year in Review, Stream Habitat 2022 Year in Review, Stream Habitat from Prioritization to Implementation, and our last item, conservation and management of Pennsylvania crayfish. I would also like to ask uh, Bob Cassis, our assistant counsel at this time, to present any public comments received uh, into the record. Are there any, Bob? Commissioner Anderson, there are no public comments. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will move ahead with our first presentation here uh, today, and uh, we'll have discussion on it later. And our presenter will be Ben Page, who is the chief of our Lake Habitat section. So go ahead, uh, Ben, when you're ready. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Can everybody hear me? Yes, you sound good. All right, thanks. Uh, today, I'm going to walk through uh, habitat surveys, projects, and project funding from 2022, and also talk about a few of the large-scale projects we have upcoming in 2023. Next slide. So in 2022, we had nine large-scale projects. Those are projects involving heavy machinery, uh, a lot of shoreline stabilization, and sometimes placing uh, large scale structures right on the lake bottom during drawdown. We were also involved in 17 volunteer scale projects. Those projects are aligned with a volunteer group typically, uh, working at a boat launch, placing those structures via boat during full pool, uh, during full pool elevation at those, those reservoirs. Uh, uh, very excited that we leveraged over $805,000 uh, in grant funding. Uh, those are going towards all of the different habitat projects, a lot of large scale habitat projects in Pennsylvania. In addition to the habitat projects, we also had 14 habitat surveys statewide. Next slide. And on this slide, uh, this is to demonstrate the large distribution across the state of the volunteer scale and large scale habitat projects. So the volunteer scale being the dark blue and the large scale being the teal colored. Um, and what you'll notice here is some of these uh, lakes have multiple projects on the same body of water. Oftentimes, you know, very good partnerships and uh, uh, grant funding will enable us to do that. And you'll see that at Lake Wilhelm, Glendale Lake, and Raystown Lake where we were able to accomplish large-scale projects and volunteer scale. Next slide. In addition to on-the-ground projects, putting material in the lakes, we also do surveys. So 
Uh, this covers a couple different categories. Uh, one of those being layout. So before we ever do any of the habitat work, uh, we put together a five-year fish habitat improvement plan. So some of these are uh, layouts before we do the work. Uh, in addition to that, we also do bio-based mapping where we use electronics on our boats uh, to tell us the depth, the bottom hardness, as well as aquatic vegetation. And in addition to that, we also do some fisheries monitoring, some follow-up monitoring on some of these habitat structures to see what types and how many fish are utilizing those structures. Next slide. So this slide demonstrates the large-scale habitat projects that we did in 2022 at uh, Blue Marsh, Racetown, Kalineski, Glendale, Yellow Creek, and Lake Wilhelm. Out of these projects, uh, you know, using grant funding, PA Lake Management Society is a state grant, um, so a competitive uh, grant within our state. Um, and we were fortunate enough to leverage some funding to, uh, to fund some of these large-scale projects. Uh, in addition to that, we also have the Reservoir Fisheries Habitat Partnership. That's a national grant, so uh, you know, applying for that on a, on a nationwide basis. And we were fortunate to, to receive some of that funding as well. At Raystown Lake, uh, we worked uh, a large-scale habitat project with consent order funds between uh, Sunoco and DEP. We also worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to use some of their resource funds at multiple lakes. At Glendale Lake, uh, the Cambria County Conservation District was able to leverage growing greener funding for that large scale project. And some of these use our PFBC Cooperative Habitat Improvement Program as seed funding. In addition to that, we also use voluntary bass permit funding. Next slide. At Blue Marsh Lake, uh, we worked at Old Church Road Access, stabilizing uh, eroded shoreline, and also helping to implement a kayak launch there and adding rock rubble piles and trees. And this construction was completed with our, our own PFBC Division of Construction and Maintenance, so our operators and heavy machinery were there, uh, using $24,000 from the PA Lake Management Society and some chip funding to pay for that project. Next slide. So this is the project site conditions before we started. You can see the eroded bank there uh, at this access. You can see the picnic tables. There's a parking lot up above that. Uh, next slide. And then this is after the project. So this is during a five-foot drawdown at Blue Marsh Lake. You know, that's why you can see the, the open lake bed there. The, the lake level is down uh, during the winter months. Uh, but you can see those large stones. We use uh, stone deflectors or triangles that uh, help protect that shoreline and keep it from erosion. And it also produces really good fishing access. So if you could picture, you know, families utilizing the shoreline with good habitat on a, on a stable bank there. Next slide. This is a larger uh, picture. You know, whoever took this picture is out on the ice taking a picture back towards that access. And you can see uh, large amounts of deflectors there, the open space uh, to the left is where that kayak launch would be installed. Uh, a very high visible uh, project site there, you can see the uh, old church road on the left side there, so very visible. Uh, as I mentioned, big parking lot there where lots of shoreline anglers can come and fish and boat. Next slide. At Raystown Lake, we worked at two different sites, one being the mile marker 11 site as well as the Trough Creek Point site. Uh, I mentioned that we use consent order funding there. We also use that funding uh, to help leverage the PA Lake Management Society grant. Uh, this construction was completed by a private contractor, as well as our PFBC staff uh, manning our habitat barge. Next slide. This is mile marker 11. You can see the heavily eroded points. So if any of you have spent any time on Raystown, uh, especially on the weekends, there's a lot of uh, boat traffic making waves, in addition to it just being a large lake with a lot of wind action. So uh, some of these shorelines really get uh, a lot of erosion. And so we place these sawtooth deflectors with the barge. It's not accessible. This particular site is not accessible by land for heavy machinery. 
And so we use our aquatic dump truck, our bars, to place some of the stone to protect that shore. Next slide. In this slide, you can see our, our barge. Uh, this barge is named Rocky. It's an aquatic dump truck that can haul about 17 to 18 uh, tons at a time. And that's uh, Habitat Manager Mike Swartz up there uh, driving the barge. We bring it up to the shore there uh, to produce these uh, sawtooth deflectors. It's kind of like a, a rock wall there to protect it from the wave action. And you can see that highly eroded bank there on the right. Next slide. And this uh, is to demonstrate some of the wave action coming off of Raystown there and how these rocks can help to deflect that wind energy and produce that calm water on the backside of those, of those rocks. And then in addition to that, you can imagine the fish habitat that's produced with all the interstitial space there for crayfish, macrovertebrates, young of year uh, fish. And over time, what, what uh, some other places like Illinois has seen is you know with that calmer water behind that wall uh, you do eventually get uh, aquatic vegetation and even shrubby uh, vegetation on that shoreline next slide at glendale lake uh, as i mentioned cambria county uh, conservation district was a very important partner in this program in this particular project helping to leverage over three hundred thousand dollars in growing greener funding uh, for the Turtle Cove access and also remote shorelines at Glendale Lake. Uh, the construction was completed by a private contractor through the job order contract systems, the state system. Um, and then uh, we also had our PFBC staff there with our habitat barge and also guiding uh, that contractor on how to build those structures. So, next slide. This is one of the remote shorelines at Glendale Lake, Cambria County. You can see some of the rocks that were placed with our aquatic uh, uh, barge there. Um, and you can see some of the, some of the stone that we, we got on this project was very large and we do plan to come back in 2023 and fill in some of the gaps that, uh, that are on that shoreline there. But you can see the heavy erosion and how that rock might uh, protect that shoreline. Next slide. And this is the Turtle Cove access. So you can see all the deflectors that were placed with excavators and loaders. On the far side, there's, there was an existing uh, boat launch there, DCNR uh, boat launch, as well as a courtesy dock, small parking lot. And then at the uh, bottom center of the, the photo there, you have the, the rock barge loading site. So you'd have the barge pulled up to that and the excavator loading it with material. And then to the right of that is a newly placed uh, kayak launch, so a gravel stabilized uh, area there on the shoreline where people can launch their kayaks. Next slide. So this one's a, lo a long list. Uh, I mentioned we do a lot of uh, volunteer scale habitat projects as well, in addition to the, the large scale projects that we do. Uh, these are you know, volunteer based. A lot of times we're working out of a boat launch building structure, placing it right on the boat, and then taking those structures out to those predetermined waypoints to place those. Um, down at the bottom of the list, you'll also notice we worked at Lake Shelbyville, Illinois. Uh, Mike Swartz and I were fortunate enough to travel out to Reservoir Fish Habitat Partnership uh, National Meeting and uh, help out uh, with a, a demonstration project out there. These projects are funded through the CHIP program, as well as Army Corps Resource Funds, the Reservoir Fish Habitat Partnership Small Grant, Volunteer Bass Permit, and DCNR Resource Funds. Next slide. One example of these uh, volunteer scale projects is some of the work that we do with Commissioner Anderson in southwestern PA at Berlin, the Trobe, Salisbury, Rockwood, and Shanksville High Schools. This is a situation where we have cooperation with the, uh, the local shop teacher and the students. Uh, we can deliver the, the lumber to those sites and uh, those uh, classes build those structures uh, to be placed at Donegal Lake, Somerset Lake, and last year we placed several of them in Shawnee Lake. Next slide. This was the grand reopening at Somerset Lake. Uh, we're fortunate to be invited to talk about uh, some of the habitat that was done while the lake was down, as well as habitat structures that will be placed 
uh, now that the lake is refilled. Uh, in this picture here, you see Senator Stefano giving his autograph with a young man uh, putting it right on the fish habitat structure. Uh, in the background there, you have Commissioner Anderson talking to the, the local news media, as well as Executive Director uh, Tim Schaefer talking to one of the uh, local anglers. So it was a good day. We had a lot, you know, a larger crowd than what you see here, uh, you know, for, for our audience and, and some of the uh, uh, talks that we did. Uh, but uh, we're happy to have Somerset refilled, and we actually had a construction crew down there two weeks ago to work on the shoreline that you see, and so some of that's fixed up for some better fish habitat and angler access. Next slide. We also worked at Lake Arthur, uh, working with Seneca Valley uh, middle school students. About 80 middle school students were there on their field trip, uh, built 45 brush cribs and placed those. We also worked with our seasonal staff to train them up on uh, felled shoreline trees. So we, we will fell, you know, fell and cable trees in as fish habitat as well. Next slide. At FJ Sayers, uh, we had several different requests for volunteer scale projects at this lake here in Center County, conveniently right up the road here from Crow, our center region office. Uh, we worked with the Wildlife Leadership Academy Bass Camp, so young students learning about uh, the outdoors and the environment, build structure with them. We also worked with our uh, cadets, our waterways conservation officers that, are, that last year were finishing up their training, uh, gave them a great opportunity to get hands-on experience building and placing structure with the habitat staff. Uh, we also had a middle school field trip with OLV, um, school right here in, in State College, uh, got a chance to explain, you know, habitat and how we, we place that. So, next slide. Uh, East Branch Lake, this is a project that was planned for several years. We were able to leverage Cinema Hunter Watershed Grant um, and place several of these short vertical plank structures. So, in East Branch Lake, there's a large amount of uh, rock type structure, but not a whole lot of, of wood in some of the deeper portions of the lake. And so we were able to work with Army Corps of Engineers as well as DCNR to place some of these structures. Next slide. Looking at 2023, we're pretty excited. We were able to leverage um, a Bass Pro Shops grant, or two of those. This is a nationally competitive grant. Uh, we were able to uh, get some funding for Pima Tuning as well as Blue Marsh Lake. Both of these projects involve shoreline stabilization as well as uh, uh, open water placement. So we'll also be working with volunteers placing some structures by boat. Next slide. Continuing our Glendale Lake Cambria County project, uh, this is a continuation of what I showed you there in 2022. So we still have a lot of work there. Uh, to finish that project up. Next slide. Also working at Somerset Lake and Raystown Lake with the Reservoir Fish Habitat Partnership Funding. This is another nationally uh, competitive grant. Uh, we were able to leverage uh, two of those to come here to Pennsylvania and improve some of the habitat there, Raystown and Somerset. Next slide. Also working with Jack Field at the uh, DCNR uh, resource section, uh, he's been able to provide funding for some of his state parks and, and we've been happy to work with him improving uh, fish habitat and angler access as well as shoreline stabilization. So working with him, we actually have a crew up at FJ Stairs uh, Bald Eagle State Park today working on shoreline stabilization and we have future work to be done at Lake Wilhelm as well. Next slide. All right, so those were a few of what we have coming up in 2023. Uh, we will have a field schedule uh, produced uh, by the beginning of March, and that can be shared with commissioners. The commissioners are always welcome to join us out in the field. Um, so with that, I will uh, open it up to any questions. Does anybody have any uh, questions for Ben? Yeah, Don, this is Commissioner Hussar. A uh, couple things. So the grow the grower greening money is already allotted for this year, this 2023 year, for the most part. Is that yeah. allocated out? That's true. That so this is money that was awarded 
last year. Okay. Does that come up again this year, or has that not been decided? You know, for the following year, then the growing, or, the growing greener funding. Yes, as far as I know, there should be another round coming out. And then we don't, you don't, you never know the amounts of that. It's right. I mean, it it could, it could vary year to year on the grower greener, you know, the grower growing greener uh, funding that changes year by year. What's available, what's not. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, that's true, yeah. And then one more question. The, I, I, you know, I saw, and that was nice you had it up there, the Bass Pro Shops made a, obviously a significant donation or however you grant or however. They, it was a grant, I guess, correct? Yeah, so what they did last year for all of their regional qualifying bass tournaments, they collected all of that money, and then Johnny Morris or – BASS, or I should say Bass Pro Shops matched that money and then turned it into a, a nationwide Habitat grant uh, that was run through uh, uh, National Fish Habitat Partnership. Okay. Do we, will we market that grant from them anyway to the, you know, to the public? I mean, is that... Do we have signs down there? Is that something we do? Is that something we should consider doing? I mean, that's that's a sizable grant to both of those locations. Um, I, I, you know, from a partnership, I mean, from that standpoint, is there any way to get, um, you know, highlight it and it highlights their what they do and it highlights what we do and the partnership together? Is that something we've ever considered or? Yeah, I do think that is the idea behind it. I haven't, you know, I haven't got into the details of that, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're correct there where they're going to want to get, uh, you know, some miles out of it and, you know, show where this money is going. Okay. Yeah. I, I just think, you know, looking forward that, that is the type of synergies we need with the private sector and what they do for us. And, uh, you know, um, and marketing that out to the public, you know, their contribution to habitat development. But, okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Ben? Okay, we will move on then to our next uh, discussion, discussion item, uh, the stream habitat work. 2022 year in review. So, Mark Saucer, uh, go ahead with your presentation. Hey, hey, hey Don Anderson, this is Tim Schaefer. Can you hear me yeah. okay? Yeah, I, sorry, took myself off mute too, too late. Just wanted to remind commissioners, if you've not been out uh, to see the lake habitat section in action, when we do uh, put our field schedule out, in this, uh, typically, I believe, Ben, it's in March, um, definitely encourage you to take advantage of seeing this stuff. It's really impressive to see it in person. So um, just know that that's an open invitation uh, to join our staff in the field. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, Mark, are you ready with your presentation? Yes, sir. Okay, and go ahead. All right, well, good afternoon, commissioners and members of the public. Again, my name is Mark Saucer. I'm the Stream Habitat Section Chief within our Division of Habitat Management. And today I have a double feature of presentations and I'll first start off with the 2022 Stream Habitat Annual Report, uh, followed by a second presentation on how we prioritize and implement our stream habitat projects. So in this first presentation, we're gonna highlight uh, what our stream habitat section is, we have uh, two units. Uh, then we'll take a look at the 2022 uh, project construction accomplishments. We'll look at some highlighted projects, including three voluntary permit projects. Uh, we'll have a West Branch, Susquehanna River Red Survey in Cambria County. And we're gonna look forward to some 2023 highlighted projects. Next slide. So the stream habitat section has two units. We have a statewide unit. There's two, two full-time stream, stream habitat managers, and we have three seasonal fisheries biologist aides. Our second unit is the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Habitat Unit. That's partnered with the EPA. We have four full-time stream habitat managers and four 
seasonal fisheries biologist at Yates. Next slide, please. 2022 project construction accomplishments. We completed 53 projects in 23 counties on 44 streams. Completed 8.25 miles of stream statewide. And out of that, there was 7.15 miles improved in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Next slide. We were able to construct uh, 1,100 structures and that equated to one structure every 40 feet of stream improved. And that's significant because when we actually get into work on a stream section, we want to maximize our efforts as much as possible and also to increase uh, the anglers uh, spots they're able to fish throughout that section. Our average project cost was $30,000. And that was $38.87 per foot of stream improved. And that equals uh, for every $1 PFBC contributed, our partners contributed an additional $4.50 of additional funding. That's an increase of 450%. So next slide. So we'll look at some of these highlighted projects. Again, we have 53 of them, so these are just the uh, the main highlighted ones. So we started with Plunkett's Creek in Lycoming County. It's a naturally reproducing trout stream, partnered with the Game Commission. A multi-year project, this was phase two, and we approved 1,000 feet of stream using a series of cross veins to provide pool habitat. Next slide. We have Buffalo Creek, Butler County, Chicora Park partnered with Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and Butler County Conservation District. We improved 825 feet of stream, stabilized eroding banks, and provided pool habitat. Next slide. Honey Creek, Mifflin County, it was Reed's Gap State Park. We partnered with Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. We improved 3,160 feet of stream stabilized eroding banks and provided riffle run and pool habitats with our structures. And we also did uh, part of the 3,000 feet, we did about 2,000 of large wood and chop and drop uh, additions. Next slide. We have Spring Creek, Union County. We partnered with North Central Pennsylvania Conservancy, DEP, Game Commission, Union County Conservation District and Giants Food Stores. We improved 2,120 feet of stream, stabilizing eroding banks and provided riffle run pool and overhead cover habitats. Next slide, please. Little Pine Creek, Lycoming County, Little Pine Creek State Park. There's a Keystone Select Trout Water, partnered with the North Central Pennsylvania Conservancy and DCNR. We improved 1,000 feet of stream, and the main highlight here was a 16-foot high eroding bank, and we provided overhead cover and random boulder habitats. Next slide. Here we're showcasing this project uh, with the during and immediately after construction photos. Uh, focusing on the left, this was during construction. Uh, you could see we, we did a soft tooth modified mud sill with extending sill logs out the stream for additional habitat. On top of the rocks at the stream edge, you'll see some green vegetation. These are eight to 10 foot long willow branches that we put down for use as live stakes. So just to get the perspective, the amount of bank where you claimed there, we claimed uh, 25 feet. And those, again, those willow branches are eight to 10 feet long. And then focusing on the picture on the right, uh, the bank was graded uh, to maximize uh, a three to one slope as much as we could and get dirt so vegetation can grow on the newly established uh, bank. Next slide. So the voluntary permit projects, there are three wild trout enhanced water permits projects. These donations contribute Contribute from the general public that specifically purchased the wild trout and enhanced waters permit. In total, 49,000 of permit funds were spent on these projects. 
our partners contribute 63,500 of additional funding. So for every $1 Fish and Boat Commission contributed, our partners contributed an additional $1.29. Next slide. To start off with the voluntary permit projects, we did one on Spring Creek, Center County. This Fish and Boat Commission's Shia La Road Benner Access. And we partnered with Spring Creek Chapter of Trout Unlimited. We improved 1,200 feet of stream, and we narrowed the stream width to increase flow velocity to keep water temperatures cooler and prevent sediment deposition. Next slide. Bruce Creek, Huntington County, the Franklinville Access. We partnered with Pencil Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the Little Juniata River Association. We improved 750 feet of stream, we increased riffle run and pool habitats, and here we additionally planted 115 trees, shrubs, and a native wildflower plot. Next slide. Walnut Run. Cambria County, this was private property. It's now open to the public by the use of the PFBC 60 Fishing Access Agreement. We partnered with the Cambria County Conservation District. We improved 250 feet of stream. We stabilized stream banks and provided overhead cover habitat. Next slide. So the West Branch Susquehanna River Red Surveys um, we have two locations uh, on the West Branch in the towns of Cherry Tree and Northern Cambria and Cambria County. Uh, the first red surveys were completed in 2016 on four stream sections. So there's two sections uh, located in, in the town of Cherry Tree and two sections located in Northern Cambria. One of each sections were used as a baseline where habitat work was not completed, listed as untreated, and one of each of those sections where stream work was completed, labeled as treated. Next slide. So here's the graphs of our finding from 2016. I will focus on the red, which is the town of Cherry Tree. On the left, it shows that there was four reds uh, surveyed in the untreated section. And on the right-hand side, we found 20 in the treated section where we had stream habitat improvement work. So this correlation shows that in the town of Cherry Tree in that section, the spawning uh, fish did prefer, prefer our habitat structures. Now focusing on the blue, which was our Northern Cambria site, we had four in the untreated, and we had the exact same total in the treated section. So there was no differentiating between where our habitat work was constructed and not constructed in Northern Cambria. Next slide, please. So surveys were not conducted in a three-year period from 2017 to 2019 due to flood events and weather conditions. So by 2020, all the untreated sections we're now treated with stream habitat improvement structures from the previous summers. So the surveys were able to pick back up, uh, the weather improved, we didn't have any flood events, and we actually had a, a three-year period of no interruptions. So we were able to conduct surveys in 2020 and 2021 and 2022. Next slide. So here we'll focus on the red, the town of Cherry Tree once again. And in 2016, the total accumulation of reds that were uh, found was 24. In 2020, after the flood events, when we were able to survey again, uh, the number was 11. 2021, they started to rebound. We had 18 reds surveyed. And in 2022, we finally got uh, just about the same amount of number as when we started in 2016. Focusing on the blue, Northern Cambria, 2016, the total amount of reds we surveyed it was eight. And in 2020, it more than doubled, increased again in 2021 to 28. And in 2022, it jumped all the way up to 79. So looking back from the initial survey in 2016, that we had eight to the final product in 2022, we almost had a full 10% uh, uh, 10 times increase of what we originally surveyed. 
next slide. So 2023 highlighted projects uh, for the statewide unit that we're looking forward to. And we got the Little Lehigh Creek and Lehigh County. This is a very good cold water stream that's a uh, year-round cold water fishery. We have McMichaels Creek in Monroe County. This is a Keystone Select uh, uh, Trout Waters. We have the east, east Branch of Clearing River. This is a very good um, cold water discharge coming out of the reservoir. So it's good cold water uh, fishing year-round. Uh, Bob's Creek, it's very good mix of Class A and B uh, populations. And the North Fork, Red Bank Creek, Jefferson County, um, this is a very highlighted uh, project uh, due to some local uh, stocking that's, there's stocking being done year round in this section of stream. Next slide. And for our Chesapeake Bay unit, uh, we're looking forward to working, uh, continuing to working on Spring Creek in Center County, Little Shemokin Creek, or the Northumberland County. Wallace Run and phase uh, three will now be completed on Plunkett's Creek. Hogs Town Run, it's a 3,000 foot project with Cumberland County. Multiple projects on the Yellow Breaches. And we do have one voluntary permit project this year to complete on Slab Cabin Run in Center County. Next slide. And we do have uh, a lot more projects uh, to complete in 2023. Those are just some of the highlighted ones. And just like Ben mentioned, uh, we, we should be able to share our construction calendar uh, sometime in March and be able to present that. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, does, does anyone have any questions uh, for Mark on his presentation? Yeah, Mark, Eric Hussar again. Um, how many miles uh, roughly with the first five are we looking at the, the, our, uh, our stream sections we're working on? The first five that were listed there for 2023. Do you know how many, an estimate of how many miles that's going to be or? Uh, yeah, for the state, statewide or for the state? Statewide, statewide. statewide. Uh, Tyler, do you mind going back two slides for me? Was the, was the, did I miss the miles? That, that one there, yeah, statewide yeah. unit. Uh, the McMichaels Creek, uh, I believe we're gonna accomplish that one in phases. Uh, there is attempts to get enough money to do the whole, the whole project stretch, which I think is close to 3,000 feet. I believe the Little Lehigh Creek is about 1,000 feet. Okay. Uh, East Branch Clarion's pushing, I think, uh, 2,500 feet. And the Bob's Creek, we have multiple projects on that, which is probably combining all of them is probably about 1,500 feet. And the North Fork Red Bank Creek, that's over 2,000 feet. So these are these are mostly the bigger projects uh, that we're dealing with this year. So that's a little over a mile or two, two miles. Yeah, yeah. and we're we're getting close to two miles just with these five projects. That's correct. Yeah. And then the Chesapeake Bay is probably similar. We're doing, they're doing 1,000, 2,000 feet, 1,000 yeah, foot projects, 2,000 foot projects. Yes, that, that is correct. Yeah, most of all those are definitely over 1,000 foot projects, yes. Okay. I mean, have you, well, I'll wait, maybe this will go into the next, your next topic of prioritizing and implementation I'll, I'll bring it up at the next section some questions on that going forward I will I will say that and I said this at the board meeting um, in January I believe or October the the project on Spruce Creek um, came out of it, it looks great I've seen that I'm all out they all have I've seen the little pine one on the delayed delayed harvest that looks super um, our project on the property there in Spruce Creek looks phenomenal. And then the uh, the other one I saw was the Spring Creek one at Benner, which is, well, that was needed and it looks good. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing those up. Uh, Spruce Creek is a, a fully completed project. The Little Pine project, uh, we're partnering with Jack Hill and DCNR on that one, uh, we're attempting do an additional three to 4,000 feet downstream of that project that was 
highlighted in this one. So huge, huge undertaking, uh, Moto Pines Park there. And Spring Creek Benner uh, access site that you mentioned, we're also doing almost the same amount of work on the opposite side of the, the stream this year. So that will fully complete that section of oh, that, Spring Yeah, that's great. That, that well needed and it looks great on the one side already. That's that's gonna make a big difference there. Yeah, thank you very much for mentioning that. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Mark on this presentation? Um, Mark, this is Dan Pastori. Would the potential improvement on Lower Walnut Creek to allow fish to pass, would that be within your Division as a stream improvement. Commissioner Pastori, this is Tyler Neiman, the division chief of habitat management. I can speak to that. So I'm taking the, the lead on that project. If, um, we can, that's something that we are, are taking the lead on <clears throat> here with the division of habitat management, not within the stream habitat section. Okay, thanks. So, am I correct? There's still at least a possibility that would be a project for this year. So currently where we're at with the, the project of, of Walnut Creek is we're in the process of working through a, a feasibility study with our partners uh, to determine um, if there are viable options to improve uh, fish passage, steelhead passage at the, the project site you're describing. Is there a chance we'll do it this year if we do do the project? It was my understanding right. we were right. actually having it engineered and then based on that engineering study, we may or may not be able to do it this year. Yeah, that's correct. So we're, it's too it's too early to determine, um, but we have to wait till the feasibility study is done and then um, have to get a plan in place if, if a plan is possible and we would need to you know, fundraise to, to earn the, the funding to, to pay for a plan if a plan is possible. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if hey, there's Don, no other Don, questions. Yeah, yeah. Don, this is, yeah, two, two things just I'll note for everybody. I'm glad Tyler spoke up. The um, the Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies annual meeting um, moves around uh, the Northeast and is going to be in Hershey this year. And we host it about every 10 years. And um, it's going to be from the uh, April 30th through May 2nd. And at the Opening plenary session on the 1st, um, Tyler and some of our partners from North central Pennsylvania are going to be talking about the great work that they've done um, to re really a, a multi state audience. So 1 more reason if folks are considering attending that Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies event uh, would be, be to hear Tyler's summary there. Um, secondly, uh, on the federal level, 1 of the ways that a lot of great stream. Um, uh, restoration work is supported is through programs of the federal farm bill. Um, the farm bill is up for reauthorization this year. Uh, Pennsylvania uh, is really lucky to have Congressman G.T. Thompson as the chair of the agriculture committee in the house. Uh, met with him just last week uh, to talk about the conservation and water quality benefits of farm bill programs. So um, just for, for the commissioners know uh, that we have an active seat at the table. Um, at the federal level to make sure the conservation title of the farm bill is as 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 big as possible. Um, a lot of the work that Mark talked about, as well as um, other things that our stream habitat unit do, you know, think of the Tyler describes it. We're the ones that are in the stream, but if you go the whole way up to the barnyard, maybe starting from the barn the whole way down to the stream, those projects that happen further up before they get to where we're working, um, a lot of them are, are funded through federal. Farm bill funding and um, looking forward to getting that that piece of legislation reauthorized this year in Congress. Thanks, Don. Okay. Hey, Don, I have one more question. This is sure. Eric. Um, and Tyler, you may be able to answer this or any. Um, looking at 2022, how many? Do you have any idea what our partners? Did in 22 that we weren't part of other than per, the permitting process. I mean, do you have any numbers of streams and 
miles or um, in regards to partners with different organizations? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Hussar. To, uh, to answer your qu question directly, no, we do not have a direct number to know what uh, amount of projects or miles that our partners are putting in on the ground, similar to what our staff are doing. Um, we do, as you kind of mentioned, we do review permits um, that for all the work that goes on on a statewide basis, but that does not necessarily mean that that work is being done in any given year or done at all. It's just the permitting process of it. But um, I think to your point, there is a lot of work going on with a lot of other partners out there, um, state, local, and federal partners um, that are doing this work all around the state. Okay, great. You answered that. And uh, I, I just, I'd be curious to know. I mean, I like you said, and I know some don't all get off, teed off the year you permit them, but uh, um, just to sort of grasp the total scope of work being done in the Commonwealth would be, I'd be curious to know. But uh, maybe it's similar to what we just um, illustrated there. But uh, no, that's good. Thank you. I could add a little bit to that. Um, um, we did do we did complete 53 projects this year, and they were the projects that Fish and Boat Commission were responsible for, and they all had a GP1 permit uh, for them as part of review. And in total, we reviewed roughly about 130 or so in 2022. So um, there was about 80, 80 or so GP1s that came in that Fish and Boat Commission reviewed that were for fish habitat enhancement type projects. And I do know a little bit offhand, there was probably 20 to 30 of those. I also know that they were partners that we've trained up uh, for throughout the years that didn't have our direct involvement that they handled. And the remaining is uh, up to other consultant works and things like that. But we have a good handle between our partners and direct partnerships through us that uh, is probably close to 80 or so projects that had GP1 reviews for 2022. Now, whether all those projects were actually constructed in 22, that's, we, we don't have a follow-up for that. Yeah, no, that's fine. That, that gives, I mean, that's, yeah, that makes sense. So thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll let Mark move on to his uh, next presentation, Stream Habitat from Prioritization to Implementation. So the outline of this presentation is uh, going to be looking at the, the Habitat Improvement Prioritization Work Group, and that work group had uh, two objectives, and the first was to identify key parameters, and we'll take a look at the, the six key parameters uh, that were chosen. And the second objective uh, was a GIS model map uh, to input and uh, output the priority levels one, twos, and threes. And we'll take a look at on the ground project considerations and how we could use uh, our model for a proactive and a reactive uh, approaches. Next slide. A little bit of history of the Habitat Improvement Prioritization Work Group. Uh, it was created in 2014 to prioritize individual stream sections for considerations for implementing stream habitat improvements. It included staff from the Division of Fisheries Management, Division of Habitat Management, and the Geospatial Technologies and Business Solutions section. Next slide. So objective one was to identify key parameters that could collectively distinguish and label each stream section into a priority level. And the second objective was to be able to create a GIS model that would be able to display all the stream sections based on priority level one, two, or three. Next slide. So objective one, the, the key parameters. So the work group was tasked about only identifying the parameters based on a uh, PFBC focus, but also include the focus of our partners and potential funding opportunities. The work group identified six key parameters that were determined to be essential for in, including every stream section's priority level for implementing stream habitat improvement projects. Next slide, please. 
So the six key parameters, so each parameter was numbered one through six, the most important to least important to prioritize implementing stream habitat improvement devices. Each parameter was given a numeric score, emphasizing its priority. The total score for each stream section was then separated into three priority levels. And to further explain this, so each, each stream section is getting screened based off of the six scoring parameters to see what the total score it will receive. And once that total score is calculated, it is then determined what priority level would be, either a one, two, or three. Next slide, please. So the first one was trout biomass, and this is a class A, B, C, D, and E. They were all given a respective score. The second was high angler use for wild trout waters, as well as stock trout waters. The high angler use, uh, this information was obtained from each area fisheries manager, as they were asked to provide up to 10 stream sections for each. Next slide, please. Number three was limestone influence stream sections. Limestone influenced waters were essential for flow volume, alkalinity, and cold water temperatures with less fluctuations year round. Public land, it was important to focus on areas where the general public can benefit from these stream habitat improvements. Next slide, please. And number five were stream sections adjacent to class A sections. Important to identify limiting factors of these adjacent sections to attempt to raise their bio mass to class A. And then finally, the impaired stream section DEP 303D list. These are stream sections that are a focus for our partners, a funding source, and they have been monitored. Next slide, please. Other prioritization parameters that did not receive a score, but they're deemed uh, as an essential focus, a goal, or objective set by PFDC or partners. So one of these is the EPA Chesapeake Bay Implementation Grant Partnership. Uh, PFDC staff are tasked with improving the water quality and species of greatest conservation need, a species that PFPC extreme habitat devices may benefit. Next slide, please. So objective two is creating the GIS model or map. So with the six scoring parameters identified, the work group needs to be able to display the stream sections on a map. The models and data must be shareable with our partners and the model needs to be able to be updated rendering new information. Next slide. So now that the, we have the scoring system set, we have priority levels of one, twos, and threes. Um, all the stream sections were scored using the parameters and the data was inserted into the GIS model. Uh, the model ended up scoring uh, just a little over 45,000 miles of stream and with that, the priority one levels, we had 490 stream sections, which made up about 4% of all the stream sections scored. There's 326 different streams and calculated to 1,700 miles of priority level one streams to focus on. Next slide, please. Here is a map representing the priority level one streams. So this is all 1,700 miles of stream focus. And you can see there's, there's a pretty good, uh, well-rounded distribution throughout the state. And that was one of the, the goals and objectives of the work group. Next slide, please. Here's a priority level one and two. When the priority level two gets overlaid with priority level ones, uh, there was an additional uh, 14,000 miles of priority level two streams. Next slide, please. And here's the additional uh, roughly 29,000 miles of priority three streams overlaid.
Next slide, please. So on the ground project considerations, uh, the work group created the model, but once we start to focus on what the model told us and places to focus on, uh, those considerations are we need a willing landowner and machinery access, we need to find partners and funding. Next slide, please. So a willing landowner, so the property must have equipment access. The landowner must be willing to sign the permit application and take ownership of the habitat structures. The landowner must also be willing to sign a landowner agreement that may be required from any of the funding sources that are obtained. Next slide. The partners, they have direct correspondence with the landowner for permitting and landowner agreement. They're also applying for grant funding that's going to be used to bid the project, paying for the contractors and materials, and any final grant reporting that's necessary. Next slide. Funding. A PFDC is not a funding source, so fundraising is essential. Each funding source has its own focus with priorities that must be met and also deadlines on when the funding must be spent. Uh, currently, we have been typically booked for almost two years in advance with the amount of projects that we have scheduled. Next slide, please. So the proactive and reactive approaches uh, while using the GIS model, uh, proactively, it allows our partners to focus in on areas where PFBC would like to work and approach landowners and apply for the funding. Uh, the partner can use our data to overlay on their priority maps to see where our, the two uh, focal points overlap. So we're both uh, accomplishing our priority one goals. Next slide, please. A, a reactive approach is where a partner may have already attained funding to improve a watershed. And here we could use the GIS model uh, to find the best stream sections to work on based off of the priority level. And if it also beats other PFE sources, PFBC goals described previously. Next slide. So in summary, the GIS model is a central tool for prioritizing PFBC stream habitat improvement projects with our partners. And because we are not a funding source, we are relying on partners' ability to find a willing landowner and apply for the funding. And the funding sources have priorities but also must be considered for implementation. Next slide, please. So at that, do we have any questions from prioritizing to implementation? This is Dan Pastor, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but is there a requirement that if you're doing a project on private property, that there be a that like if there's a perpetual easement for public fishing, or is that not a requirement? Uh, it it is is not a requirement. Um, we do pursue opening up uh, public fishing access through a, an easement program, whether that's internal or external, um, and we we have opened up some fishing opportunities with our PFEC 60 agreements through our Cooperative Habitat Improvement Program. But is it possible then that we're going to go in and do a stream improvement on property that's not even open to, to fishing? Yes, there has been cases where if, if it's a benefit to the upstream or downstream portions where we'd like to have a focus or there's a priority one, kind of like adjacent to a class A, if it's adjacent to a to a priority one, we would be very interested in, in still looking at it and evaluating that project if we would like to move forward with a full implementation of it. Thank you. Tyler, this is Eric Hussar. So, are you waiting the the uh, qualifiers like 
wild trout stream. You mentioned Class A, you know, the different um, classifications of streams, the trout biomass. Is that weighted different than at a higher level than, you know, a, another, a lower classification of stream? Yes. Yeah, so a, a Class A is in the highest score, and then the Class B, C, D, E, they, they get lower as, as you go down in the, in the biomass range. So, yeah, each individual class receives a different individual score. Okay, thanks. And, and you already answered my other question. I mean, the benefit of it upstream or downstream, I think that's a, an important qualifier also when prioritizing, you know, on, on, a, on a stream. The, up, the upstream habitat that, or the water and the downstream, if it goes into a class A, I think that's, um, yeah, you answered that. I'm glad that's, um, so that's weighted into the scoring too. When prioritizing? Yes. yes. That's the adjacent to class A uh, also receive their, their own scoring uh, bucket, so to say. But uh, that the adjacent to the class A's are probably the most highlighted from our partners. They, they want that information. We're getting requested for that information more so than any of the other parameters because we are finding out and roughly, you know, nine years of using this, that it is a, a very central tool used for the adjacent to class A's to locate uh, aquatic organism uh, passage barriers, so AOP, we're finding our partners using it. Um, it's also identifying uh, point sources, whether it's a good point source, it's a cold water discharge coming into that class A, making it a class A, and that's why it's not a class A up above but also the, the negative of the uh, point source if there's a pollution and why that uh, the section above is a class A but not the section below. And uh, through numerous presentations about global warming, we're, we're finding that these adjacent to class A's may be the most uh, critical class A's to, to focus on uh, to combat the, the global warming issues. So it's a very highlighted layer that uh, we are definitely utilizing uh, maximum capabilities of. Well, that's good, and I, you just, yeah, and your point's well taken there with the, the global warming aspect of it and the impact of these cool waters coming in. But, uh, okay, great, thank you. I mean, it, I, I guess my, my thoughts, so, you know, we talked about this before, you, you, you're looking, at watersheds, I mean, we mentioned Class A watersheds. I mean, that's that's a high priority area, I would think, I would hope, um, for us to take a look at when doing some of these projects. Yes, yeah, uh, the Class A's, whether it's the Class A biomass, it's getting a very high score. Uh, high angler use is also getting a very substantial score. And then if it's adjacent to the Class A, it's still drawing us um, it's getting scored from the different biomasses not being a Class A, but it's still uh, bringing us to those Class A stream sections uh, to improve that entire watershed to a Class A. Um, and the big thing to remember is those priority ones with all these considerations, there's uh, 1,700 miles to focus on, and we're averaging uh, about 8 to 10 miles of improvement a year. So there's a, there's a long list of things to focus on. <laughs> I understand that. And this is, this is part of our, uh, what we just, you just went through here, our strategic plan in regards to what we're doing, where we're at, and where we're going forward now, right? You just illustrated here through the slideshow. Yes, there are a, a lot of those uh, priorities. Yeah, Com Commissioner Hussar, this is Chris Kuhn. I just to speak to your question there as well. And and so it, there, there's there's a section in the the current trout plan that focuses specifically on on habitat, and it references the prioritization uh, work group and multiple uh, strategies that are identified for how to proceed with optimizing our our habitat enhancement efforts moving forward. And that's that's issue eleven. Yeah, that's 
that's fine, Chris. I thought it was in there, and um, yeah, I'm glad to see that. And I hope we maintain a aggressive uh, look at you know what we do, how we do it, increasing it where we can, and uh, obviously funding. Is, as you mentioned, is a big portion of it, but uh, there's opportunity there to enhance these watersheds and the habitat and a lot of these streams to, I mean, especially our Class A waters where we're not, especially the Class A's that we're not stocking, um, we're not putting um, resources into that other than habitat, um, and uh, I just think that's critical for us to continue to look at going forward. Okay, I'd uh, like to move on to our last discussion item for the day, uh, conservation and management of Pennsylvania crayfish. Uh, Dave Lieb is going to present that to us, so go ahead, Dave. Hello, everybody. Uh, Dave Lieb, I'm an invertebrate zoologist with, with the Natural Diversity Section. Um, today I'll be talking about the biology, distribution, and conservation of one of Pennsylvania's rarest crayfishes, the digger crayfish. Next slide, please. So a little background information, we have historical crayfish records from the crawfishes of Pennsylvania, published by Arnold Ortman in 1906, who was with the Carnegie Museum. And he surveyed about 300 sites across the state for crayfish. And that publication serves as a baseline for all our current efforts and, this, and the information I'll be presenting today. Next slide, please. So fast forward to modern times and relatively little additional crayfish data was collected for over 100 years until we began resurveying the state's crayfish fauna in the early 2000s. And initially, we were just interested in what had changed since Ortman's study. Uh, in 2005, our efforts began really in earnest. And during the ensuing 18 years, we have surveyed well over 3,000 sites across the state, which uh, incidentally is the most thorough crayfish survey ever conducted. Uh, so on the map below, you can see all the black circles. Those are sites we visited and thoroughly surveyed for crayfishes since 2005. So I think that really illustrates the thoroughness of our survey efforts. And the reason I mention that it's not specific necessarily to the digger crayfish, but I think it's important, important to highlight this information um, because this data under, underpins all our conservation assessments, all our management recommendations. And so very, for very rare species, such as the digger crayfish, people might ask, wonder, how do we really know that the species only occurs in a small number of sites across the Commonwealth? And the thoroughness of our survey efforts over the last 18 years provide the answer. We know because we've essentially been across the entire state and we have surveyed thousands of sites across the state. So um, next slide, please. So the focus of this talk is on one extremely rare burrowing crayfish, the digger crayfish. I'll start off with a little burrow, basic information about burrowing crayfish, because I doubt very many people out there know what a burrowing crayfish is and what its natural history, what their natural histories are. And then we'll get into the specifics of digger crayfish distribution and conservation. Next slide, please. So I said, most people probably don't have much of an idea of what a burrowing crayfish is, what its life history is. Um, they, they look very much like a crayfish you'd find in a stream and river. So probably most of the audience has seen or collected a crayfish turned over a rock. And if you compare a burrowing crayfish to a stream dwelling crayfish superficially, unless you're a crayfish taxonomist, you, taxonomist, you would not be able to tell the difference. But um, their life history and their natural history is far different. So they are, I like to think of them as an aquatic uh, group of species that lives in a terrestrial environment. So what they do, this diagram um, shows a, a picture of a burrowing crayfish colony and the hatched area is the, is the groundwater table. Um, and so what they, what burrowing crayfish do is they burrow down below the groundwater table and create these ton, this network of tunnels and resting chambers. And of course, if you've ever dug a hole, in the ground, you get below the groundwater table, it fills up with water. Well, that's essentially what they're doing. They're digging down below the groundwater table and then their resting chambers and tunnels fill up with water and they live there for almost their entire life. Um, so they're essentially creating their own 
aquatic environment in a terrestrial uh, area. Often you don't see standing water. You might see a small stream sometimes or a small wetland, but often there's just moist soil, no standing water. That's because the standing where they live in is below ground. Next slide, please. <coughs> so often, uh, well, when, when, when burrow and crayfish create their tunnels and their resting chambers, they bring the dirt to the surface and pile it around their entrance. And so often the most visible sign or even the only sign you, you're, you have a burrowing crayfish colony are these chimneys, as you can see pictured here. And they come in various shapes and sizes. The ones, the, all these, actually all these pictures are of digger crayfish, <clears throat> excuse me, digger crayfish chimneys. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but you don't always see a, a chimney. Sometimes rains occur and wash the chimneys away, or who knows, maybe the crayfish is lazy that month and doesn't move a lot of dirt out of their tunnel. But sometimes you just see holes in the ground. They often look artificial, almost like somebody's taken a post and driven it into the ground. They're very circular, but they are not artificial. They are an indication you have a burrowing crayfish colony at the site. Next slide, please. So obviously I'm a crayfish, crayfish biologist and taxonomist. I care about burrowing crayfish, but why should anybody else care? Um, and the reason is there are very important species in terrestrial environments. <clears throat> they create unique habitats through their burrowing activity. Over 200 species have been shown to use crayfish burrows during part, at least part of their life cycle. They're important with soil, soil aeration and mixing and studies have shown that plant communities are more diverse uh, in the vicinity of crayfish, burrowing crayfish colonies. Next slide, please. In Pennsylvania, the Massasauga rattlesnake is an endangered species and it depends on crayfish burrows. It overwinters in crayfish burrows. Um, and what it does is the groundwater, obviously in, in these burrows, we have groundwater. Groundwater stays at about 50 or so degrees, so much warmer than the surface. And, and so they live in this, in this uh, warmer water all winter long and keeps them from freezing. They could not survive without uh, spending the winter in crayfish burrows. And often people that are, are um, uh, collect or, or uh, survey for Massasauga rattlesnakes and other snakes will find in the springtime, they emerge and they're covered in mud <clears throat> from being down in these crayfish burrows all winter. In the Southeastern part of the state, uh, studies have shown that endangered dragonflies and damselflies depend on crayfish burrows uh, to survive droughts. So often in these, these wetlands completely dry up except for crayfish burrows with, which retain water. And that's where the dragonfly and damselfly nymphs survive the drought. There is a crawfish frog, believe it or not, in the Midwest that spends almost its entire life in, in crayfish burrows. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So um, prior to our surveys, the digger crayfish was not known from Pennsylvania. We had no burrowing crayfish records from the northwestern part of the state. Um, and that's partially because Wortman's survey was 300 sites. So far different, if I put up his survey locations versus ours, uh, his coverage was, was not, as near, not nearly as great as ours. Um, that's understandable. He was traveling by horseback and train, um, but some areas were missed and the areas which we now find digger crayfish were were missed. Next slide, please. So in 2014, I received pictures of crayfish chimneys from along roadside ditches in State Game Lands 101 in Crawford County in Northwestern Pennsylvania. I knew right away we had something um, unusual, something interesting at that point. I knew we did not have any burrowing crayfish from up in that area. I uh, also knew that across the border in Ohio, we have digger crayfish, so I suspected that digger crayfish might be in that area. Uh, but to go and see in August 2000, August of that same year, we went and excavated burrows and collected digger crayfish. Um, and in the Midwest, digger crayfish tend to prefer wet forested habitats associated with vernal pools and wet roadside ditches. So we knew the type of habitat we were looking for in Pennsylvania when we started our surveys. Next slide, please. So here's a picture up in the left, top left is a map showing State Game Lands 101 
And you can see, hopefully you can see it, that little yellow dot is the first location where we collected digger crayfish in Pennsylvania. And State Game Lands 101 straddles Erie County and Crawford County and is uh, right next to the Ohio border. You can see up in the upper northwest corner of the state. And below that map is a picture of a digger crayfish chimney. And that's actually, I believe, the first digger crayfish chimney observed in Pennsylvania. And to the right, the upper right, is uh, the first digger crayfish collected from Pennsylvania. And that's another picture below it of a digger crayfish. Uh, next slide, please. So we're probably asking why didn't Ortman find digger crayfish? And I've touched on this a little bit already, but only 300 sites were surveyed. Traveling by horseback and train is a huge state, tough to sample at the intensity that we've been able to sample in the last 20 years. So many parts of Northwestern Pennsylvania were not surveyed at all, and certainly not surveyed for burrowing crayfish. Um, and this is because many areas in Northwestern PA at the time of Ortman surveys in the late 1800s, early 1900s, had extensive wetlands, swamps, marshy areas. Uh, many of these wetlands, swamps, and marshy areas were, have since been drained for agricultural purposes. There was also a, a huge uh, pine tuning swamplands, which was a a giant area of in inhospitable um, wetlands, swamps, uh, marshy areas, really not accessible uh, at that time. So the bottom line is most digger crayfish habitat was not accessible to Ortman in the early 1900s, and therefore he did not sample it. Uh, many of those wetland habitats are now gone, either drained, ditched, or flooded by pine tuning the creation of pine tuning reservoir in 1934. Next slide, please. So our surveys, we, uh, our surveys were conducted between 2017 and 2019. Uh, we got a Wild Resources Conservation Program grant, and the objective was to determine the distribution of the digger crayfish in Pennsylvania. So we started at the only known location in State Game Lands 101 that I showed you previously, and we radiated out from there in all directions. Um, during the first year, it became obvious that digger crayfish were often associated with wet roadside ditches. Um, so ultimately, we drove almost all the roads in Western Erie and Crawford County very slowly looking for crayfish chimneys and crayfish burrows. Um, in all, we drove 330 miles of roads, uh, 673 square miles were surveyed in that area and 456 sites were examined. It's quite an intensive survey for this species and that overlays all the other data which I've already showed you um, across the entire state. So that other data allowed us to know that this was the area we need to target because we had not found it anywhere else. Next slide, please. So the results of our survey, we collected digger crayfish from nine sites. We have seven interconnected sites in and around State Game Lands 101, and that's the western side of Conneaut Creek watershed in the Lake Erie drainage. And we have two sites along Pima Tuning Reservoir in the Pima Tuning Shenango River watershed in the upper Ohio River drainage. And the Pima Tuning sites are probably a remnant of, of what probably used to be a much larger series of populations that occurred in the Pima Tuning Swamp, which was eliminated when that swamp was, was flooded and Pima Tuning Reservoir was created. Um, in Pennsylvania, the digger crayfish is only found in forested wetland sites with vernal pools and wet roadside ditches. And interestingly, all sites, and probably this is not, this was not unexpected for me, all sites were within and adjacent to state protected green spaces, um, state game lands 101 and Pima Tuning State Forest, because this species is a pretty sensitive species. It disappears uh, when you have agricultural uh, when, when their habitats are destroyed and, habit, and, and, and switched into agricultural lands um, or flooded, obviously. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so these are just pictures of, of digger crayfish habitats in Pennsylvania. To the left is a seep found in Pima Tuning uh, State Forest. And then to the right of that are pictures of roadside ditches with varying levels of water. You don't have to have necessarily a flooded ditch, although they will occur in those habitats. 
Uh, sometimes there's, sometimes there's no water at all in the ditch. It's just moist soil. Um, and the upper right is a vernal pool complex. Next slide, please. Again, more wet roadside ditches. The picture in the middle is a roadside ditch with an adjacent vernal pool complex. The upper right is a picture of a digger crayfish foraging in a wet roadside ditch, flooded roadside ditch, I should say. Next slide, next slide please. So here is a map showing our targeted survey for digger crayfish. Uh, this is the uh, 456 sites I mentioned. And um, as you can see, the, the red dot, the red dots are sites where we did not find digger crayfish. And the green dots are sites where we did find digger crayfish. You can see we have a cluster of sites around state game lands 101, which is highlighted in yellow. And then we have two sites 12 miles, about 12 miles to the south on the shorelines, not on the shorelines, but just in the forest next to Pima Tuning Reservoir. We have two sites. Um, Next slide, please. So why does the digger crayfish have a restricted distribution in Pennsylvania? Many people out there might be asking. Well, there's two factors. First is geographical barriers. So the sites we have, have uh, digger crayfish are boxed in by hills, bluffs, glacial moraines. And then the second part, and I've touched on this a number of times so far, habitat destruction. So draining of their habitats, wetlands, for example, for agricultural usage, flooding of the pine tuning swamplands to create pine tuning reservoir. In all, um, for example, 58,000 acres of wetlands were lost to agriculture and residential development in the Lake Erie Basin alone. And that's two thirds of the original total. And much of that habitat, it could have supported digger crayfish, but no longer does. Next slide, please. So here's a map showing these um, geographic barriers. So the dark red areas are areas where the slope is, is greatest. So those are hills, bluffs, moraines that I'm talking about. They were created by the last, the retreat of the last glacier, glaciers. Um, and so these dark red areas are, like I said, hills and bluffs. And burrowing crayfish cannot live in this area in hilly hilly areas because there's not enough soil moisture and it takes and the, and the groundwater table is too far down for them to get to. So if you see a dark red area, that's a barrier they cannot cross. So you can see this, the cluster of state game lands 101 sites. The uh, state game lands is outlined in black and you can see to the north of that there is a dark couple dark red bands. They cannot move north. East of that of state game lands 101 again there's dark red bands. They cannot move east. To the south, they could potentially move uh, to the south and you'd expect them to be there. Um, but the next slide will, will hopefully show you why. Next slide, please. And the next slide shows land use in that immediate area. And the browns and the yellows are agricultural lands. So those areas were probably at one time, there were probably a lot of wetlands in there, but they were drained and ditched to create um, agricultural land. So it's likely the distribution was wider, especially, especially to the south. Um, maybe the entire region between the Pima, two Pima tuning sites and state game lands 101 sites was all a big series of digger crayfish colonies, uh, but they've been eliminated by ag and the flooding of the Pima tuning swamplands. Next slide, please. So what does this all mean? Um, uh, the objective is this to is determine the conservation status of the deer crayfish and figure out how we might conserve the species in the state of Pennsylvania. And so we calculate the range of the digger crayfish, which is done in GIS, um, map, a mapping tool. Um, and it's the deer crayfish occurs over a 7.7 .7 square mile area. So that's much less than the than the less than 40 square mile criterion for endangered status in Pennsylvania. The area of occupancy, which is just the exact area, almost the exact area that digger crayfish occur, uh, is 3.5 square miles, so not a big area, and less than the four square mile criterion for endangered status in Pennsylvania. The number of occurrences, as I mentioned, is nine, which is less than the 11 occurrences 
for threatened status in the Commonwealth. So you only need to qualify in one criterion to, to match that uh, status. So bigger crayfish qualifies in two. And so uh, it's uh, based on our criteria is endangered in Pennsylvania. It's also an S1 nature, the nature serve rank is, an, is S1, which is critically imperiled. And so why do these, uh, why does, because something has a small range, why does that make it endangered? And, and the reason for that is that any small event can wipe out the entire species from the state. So if you have a disease outbreak, for example, um, in and around state game lands one-on-one, -on -one, those, those, all those populations would be gone and it would probably likely spread to the primatuning since we're only talking about 10, 12 miles. And so the species would be eliminated. Um, in contrast, if you had a species that occurred across the entire state from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, then if you had a, d a disease outbreak in the Pittsburgh area, you would lose populations, but you'd still have many other populations across the state. So that's why the small range, small area of occupancy, few occurrences, why it qualifies as endangered. And so we have a, I prepared a listing package. Um, so it is in internal review at this point. After that, it will go to PAB, the Pennsylvania Biological Survey Invertebrate Technical Committee for a vote. Um, and then it'll proceed through the, the normal process we use to, to list species uh, in the state. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a list of, again, this is just to show the underpinnings of uh, the science behind all this. Um, a bunch of publications, the top ones are burrowing crayfish in Pennsylvania and the, and the ones below it are just uh, general stream dwelling crayfish publications. These are all within the last 10 years. So a lot of this data you've seen that I threw up on the, on the screen has been peer reviewed. It's gone through a rigorous scientific process. Um, so I, I wasn't comfortable bringing any of this forth until we really done a thorough survey of Pennsylvania and we are, we are at that point now and this is the first crayfish we're, we're bringing forth. Um, next slide, please. So I'll answer any questions or comments that, that folks have. Dave, hey, this is Bill Goodman. I just have to say that was fascinating. Um, Thank you, I and, appreciate that. And, and, Representative, first of all, of your expertise, knowledge, and the dedication you put into it, but also representative of the value that Pennsylvanians as a, as a whole get from fishing license dollars. You know, you're, you're doing more research now with less staff than five years ago for a worthwhile cause. That, that's just fascinating. Thank you very much. I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Dave, Eric Hussar, so I know you're in the review process now. What do you do year 23 this year and going forward? Are you going to be back out in the field uh, sampling and doing these uh, surveys, or what, what do you do next? And, I, and again, I'll concur what Bill said. Um, outstanding uh, presentation there. I like the peer review part there at the end. I think that's important. Um, with anything we do, um, but what do you do going forward then? Yeah, so this this species is pretty much um, we'll we continue to to uh, we'll probably continue to go up and monitor existing populations, um, but we pretty much are certain that we're pretty sure where the species occurs in the state. So we're moving on. We'll target other species. Uh, we have been targeting other species and go through the same process with those other species. And before I stop, I did forget one slide and I and I don't wanna forget this one. This is an acknowledgement slide and all these sites, this was not just me. Uh, I was working with a number of colleagues, particularly I'd like to call out for this species, Dr. Zach Lofman and the West Liberty University Crayfish lab. Uh, we, we share graduate students. So I've had uh, Dr. Lofen and I have had uh, three graduate students on this project. Tanya Khan did her master's thesis on it. And then Patrick Allison um, and Audrey Sykes also helped. So it's it's been a real team effort. Um, 
uh, with this project. But back to your question. So we'll move on to the next species. We have an undescribed species in, in Pennsylvania that I've, I've been working on the formal description of that species, which is extremely rare, it occurs in the southeastern part of the state. So that will be one of our next uh, species we bring forth. Um, we have another one, a devil crayfish, that just occurs in the south, uh, the coastal plain. So we'll move to the next species and do the same thing. This this will probably be a year long process to get this the digger crayfish listed, and like I said, we'll we'll move on uh, to the next one. So you'll they, you'll periodically monitor those sites that you found already with this digger crayfish. Yes, yes, we will. And once um and once we get the species listed, we'll we'll put together a management plan. Um, for the species, and, and that will most certainly include monitoring, periodic monitoring. Um, and, and there are some things um, that I think we can do in a management sense. Uh, the dependency on roadside ditches uh, is interesting and worthy of management because obviously in, in the wintertime, it's a lot of snow in Northwestern Pennsylvania. We apply a lot of salt and so forth. We actually, these ditches are actually periodically um, heavy machinery digs them out and we've been there at, at times when that's happened and so the timing of that is important because these the species occurs in the, the the gravid females with the eggs and the young are found in these ditches in the spring um, for about a month or two and after that they live in their burrows so we can time it so that these these uh, ditches are are maintained when the species is underground and not in the actual ditch, um, that will help to preserve the species long term. So that's there's definitely some management actions. Also, um, these these species occur in the fringe of the state game lands and the fringe of pine tuning state forest. So areas around it, um, say if they become uh, urbanized and developments go up immediately adjacent to these colonies, um, we would want to manage that process um, somehow. So uh, th there's immediate conservation management things we can do. But the first step would be to put together a management plan, and that will be after the listing is complete. Dave, Don Anderson here. I have a question for you. When you found uh, these locations on Game Lands 101 that, that had the uh, digger crayfish, how many individuals were there like at each site where you you found them? Just just one or two, or were there several? Yeah, so the study, um, we actually did a um, an extensive study sample monthly. Um, we, we only collected, I think a total across three years was, I'm thinking 256 stands out, but it was somewhere between 250 and 300 individuals total that we've ever collected from Pennsylvania. So we don't have a lot of individuals. We don't have an exact density estimate. These, this digger, our burrowing crepes in general are notoriously difficult to get a actual population estimate. Um, it might be possible and that might be something we might attempt to do with a sort of a mark recapture type effort. But at, at this point, we don't know, although you know, there certainly are less, I would say there's less than a thousand individuals in the state, certainly, and maybe less than 500. So we don't have very many of them. Okay, my, my next question to you would be, would it make sense to try to transplant some of those individuals uh, to some other nearby sites that uh, you feel the habitat would be adequate at this time? to sort of maybe protect the uh, the species overall in some way, would that be good or would it be bad? Yeah, that, that's, a great, that's a great comment um, and that has been done. And so my colleague, uh, Zach Lofman has done that with another burrowing crayfish in West Virginia, where there was a, I believe it was a construction project or something that was unavoidable. He was able to move uh, another species and reestablish it somewhere else. Um, so, but that's always a risk risk because um, these are, this is a very intolerant species and we don't really understand exactly. I mean, we crudely know it's associated with wet forests and undeveloped lands, but as far as the particulars, um, 
we're not exactly sure. The species he moved was much more, much more of a generalist, um, but it certainly is a thought, uh, something to consider. We, I think I would want to know how many individuals are out there. So I know we're not moving, uh, you know, a large, a large, a large percentage of the individuals from any one site. Um, so I think that would be, yeah, we, we probably need to do some more science for that, but that would be a possibility for sure. And, and, a, and a good consideration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dave, Are there this, any other questions? Dave, this is Charlie yeah. Charlesworth. Um, what's the approximate diameter of those, uh, the holes that they dig? Yeah, it's only an inch or two across. <clears throat> they're not they're not very big holes. Um, I, I would imagine most people that have been walking around hunters and so forth have seen a burrowing crayfish tunnel or chimney at some point um or i've not seen them but maybe come been in the air vicinity of a colony but if if you're not looking for them they might be hard to see they're not they're not terribly big and often you have to move leaves and vegetation to see them thank you certainly well, uh, this is Dan Pastore. I guess I had a similar question, and I can see it both ways. It, um, I think the public would probably be really interested in knowing about this, and might even be interested in going out and seeing if they can find more. Is that something we would want to do, like to help just locate them, like hunters who are out or anglers who are in the area? Or is that something you're concerned about? People maybe damaging them if they if they're out there looking for them. I think it would be fascinating. There's groups up here in the in the Erie County area or around Pima Tuning that I think would really be interested in hearing a presentation on this. I, yeah, I think it would, it would work both ways. <clears throat> Typically, for a species like this, we won't release the the exact coordinates of these colonies um, just for concern with people being over interested for lack of a better word um, you you can do damage to these colonies um, if you dig up too many burrows um, once you dig in and destroy a burrow it's gone uh, obviously these crayfish spend a tremendous amount of effort creating their burrows uh, and that if they're forced to create another one that's energy they don't have to reproduce or survive so it's a mixed bag i mean it, it's not a bad thing we we have gotten uh i've given a couple presentations over the years uh, i think the last one i gave was on burrowing crayfish in general and not on this exact crate species and it was covered in newspapers and things we got feedback on people that had seen burrows sometimes even in their yards and, and that provided data for us for sure um, so, it, yeah, I think it can be a, an advantage as long as it's, um, we use it correctly and are careful about how we present our data. Are there any other uh, questions uh, for uh, Dave? Okay, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank all of our presenters today. I think uh, you three gentlemen did an excellent job. Uh, uh, I'm always impressed with uh, uh, the work you do and, uh, and that uh, for our agency, for our resources. So uh, thank you for enlightening us uh, here on all the work you've been doing in the past year. Uh, at this time, is there any other new business that needs to be brought up before the committee? Before we get to that, Commissioner Anderson, this is Chris Kuhn. Um, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to, to make a, a, a comment here that came to mind during some of the discussions that were that were ongoing here before we get into new business. And I, I'd like to start off by just echoing what you said. Um, certainly appreciate all the staff time and work on these important initiatives that we heard about today in the informative presentations. And thinking back to the stream habitat um, presentations by uh, Mark Saucer, just looking at uh, the class A's, the class B's, the different biomass designations and the focus on wild trout, 
We often think about stream habitat and, and water quality in particular as being a primary limiting factor to, to wild trout populations. And so that was the, the, the prioritization process that, that Mark describes as a way to emphasize focusing in on those class A's to, to maintain the best of our best, but also to improve upon biomasses of, of, of lower density. And that also goes for aquatic organism passage. So we heard a, a presentation, oh, some time ago from our fish passage biologist, Dave DePold, about prioritizing, developing a system for prioritizing aquatic organism passage, or AOP, and focusing in on cul culverts. So all of this is tied together. Lateral connectivity is certainly critical in stream habitats, and, and, and particularly to our class A's, as, as, as wild trout will move between different habitats during different time of year to complete different types of activities for their life cycle. And so we do look at things in a, in a landscape scale perspective in, in stream habitats and fish, fish passage uh, projects that we undertake. And, and, and thinking about the number of fish passage projects and dam removals that we have ongoing in Pennsylvania, it's really impressive. And, and we're currently aware of 72 ongoing dam removal process at various levels uh, of development in Pennsylvania with our project partners. And of those, Pennsylvania is involved in, in 35, which is, is also really impressive. Um, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, that is, is, is involved in 35 of those with our partners, and, and, and yeah, that's, that's, just, that's just tremendous, but it reinforces why Pennsylvania remains a national leader in dam removals with 366 dams removed over the years. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a testament to the work that our staff is doing and the recognition of the landscape scale level perspective and tying all this kind of kind of work together. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, at this time, is there any other new business that needs to come before the committee? Don, this is Rick Kaufman. Um, again, I just want to also say great presentations to all. And uh, Dave, I know you and I couldn't connect uh, in the fall, but I'm looking forward to you coming down in the Southeast here and uh, trying again sometime. Um, while we're on, you know, we've been discussing habitat, but also environmental is part of this committee. And I, I just wanted to um, ask if we've been involved in the um, situation on the Ohio-Pennsylvania border in regards to monitoring um, any of the residual effect from the train der derailment and, um, you know, worrying, you know, and I'm not familiar with uh, all the, all the geographic figures out there, but uh, have we been involved with monitoring efforts for the stream and, uh, you know, uh, working with our partners out that way? And I'm not sure who could answer it or, um, you know, where we might be with that, but uh, um, just concerned that uh, um, to make sure that we're part of that effort. Can any uh, staff person answer Commissioner Kaufman's question right now? Sure. Yeah. Rick. This is Heather Smiles. Go ahead, Heather. Um, I just wanted to say that this morning I actually spoke, spoke to uh, the Pennsylvania DEP, Rick Spear, uh, about the train derailment. They've been closely monitoring um, the streams out there, and they're actually due to go back out tomorrow, and they've been continuing to monitor chemicals. But Heather, so Heather, we can, Heather, you're difficult uh, for us to hear there. Yeah, you're kind of fading in and out. Sorry, can you hear me now? Now that's better. Could you I start over, I, please? Sure. I spoke with Pennsylvania DEP biologist this morning, Rick Spear, um, specifically about the train derailment. And they've been closely monitoring the Little Beaver Creek out there that would flow into Pennsylvania. And so far, they have not detected any chemicals in the water or seen any um, dead aquatic life. But they've been monitoring it and keeping keeping me informed. 
And, and Rick, similar, this is Tim, if I can build on Heather's, we're also in regular, ever since the beginning of the incident, in regular contact through Pima um, with our partners in Ohio. So, um, yeah, so it, it's absolutely happening both um, at the biologist level as well as through um, the Pima and emergency management channels. So, um, at this point, it doesn't appear to have impacts here, but we are we are definitely involved. And Little Beaver Creek would uh, be in a be in Beaver County, correct? I can, can anyone can answer that? I, can I'm anyone not answer that? Sure, which county it is? I'm thinking it would be Beaver or maybe Lawrence. Yeah, I think I think it goes into Beaver around that area, Don. Okay. So you're right. I, I believe it. I don't even know how, what was the distance? Did, does anybody know the distance between the incident and our borders? But Don, I do believe it goes in around Beaver. I think, I think you're correct, Eric. I think you're right yes. on on that. Yes, this is Chris Kuhn. It, it, it's Beaver County. Okay. And again, I don't, does anybody know how far the event was, the, the, the derailment to the border? Is it 15 miles? Is it, I, I'm not quite, I don't know the distance. I'm not exactly sure. I think Rick said maybe 10 miles, but I don't exactly know for sure. Look fairly close. I don't know miles wise, but you know, when just watching and reports and, and looking at some stuff online, it, it's pretty close to the Pennsylvania border and with all this smoke and everything. Just uh, wanted to make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're on it as well. And it sounds like we are. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is there any other new business that anyone has? If not, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn the committee meeting. I'll make that motion, Don. This is Eric. Okay. Uh, do I have a second? Seconded by Rick. Okay. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>